Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Your lines are muted on this call, but I would encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the session using the chat window or the question panel that you can see on your interface. My name is Wendy Fox. I work at Greenhouse Data. I'm going to do just a quick introduction, and then I'm going to hand it over to Aman Sharma, who is our presenter today. Just a little bit about Greenhouse Data, if you're not familiar with us. We work on operationalizing innovation, including simplifying IT operations, having a deep leadership team, having 70% of our personnel in technical and client-facing roles, working really closely with our clients, and forming strategic partnerships. We are a platform agnostic managed service provider with, low, with clients all across the United States and Canada, mostly concentrated in North America, but some in Europe as well. Um, our client distribution is very much in the large public and private area. You'll recognize some of the logos received over the years. We really focus on service across several different platform areas, including multi-cloud management, professional services, delivering on DevOps frameworks, data center, and taking an application forward or an upstack position. And around all of that, we put a managed services promise. Our agenda today is to look at cloud computing in Azure, going through basic concepts. Um, Aman is going to show you a demo, tips and tricks, and then we'll leave time for questions. So our presenter today is Aman Sharma, who is a Microsoft Azure MVP and a principal technical consultant with Greenhouse Data. You can see his contact information there, and so please do feel free to reach out. And with that, I am going to turn it over. And Aman, you are the presenter. Thanks a lot, Wendy. Uh, I'm starting my screen share. Uh, can you confirm that you can see the screen? Yep, we can see it. Thanks. Perfect. So I'll dive right in. Uh, the expectation from this session should be uh, you will get to learn the basic concepts of, about Azure and you will be able to answer question uh, why Azure and build the right foundation on which to start uh, working in Azure. So uh, I'll dive right in. We'll start with cloud computing and Azure, how Azure stands with respect to cloud computing. So if you have started working with Azure or any other cloud provider, oh, what could have been the modernization triggers? And if you haven't started yet, what could be the triggers that would uh, nudge you towards adopting the cloud uh, faster and faster? Uh, these are some of the triggers that I have listed. Uh, the data center contracts uh, may be expiring. Uh, you need to deliver your application features faster. There is urgent need to increase the capacity. Uh, you want to do the refresh of software. You are running uh, Windows Server 2008. You want to leverage the latest uh, Windows Server OS. Uh, and at the same time, you want to move uh, to the cloud. Uh, you want to address security threat and leverage all that cloud has to offer. Uh, you want to be compliant and not manage the compliance part yourself. You want to automate uh, everything related to compliance. You want to enable new business opportunities. and any software end of life support. Um, when you are going through that, why not move to cloud and leverage all the benefits that cloud has to offer? So why you should be interested in cloud computing? According to Forbes and uh, Gartner surveys, the median salary for cloud computing professional in 2018 was around uh, 150K. Um, there were many new job roles that were picking up in 2018 that developed in the previous years. Some of those roles included cloud architect, cloud developer, DevOps consultant, cloud administrator, a consultant, even a cloud, uh, cloud relator, uh, multiple job roles uh, emerged. So if you want to target any of these job roles, you need to have a strong foundation. And that is what we are trying to uh, achieve in this particular session. So when you make the switch to Azure or any cloud provider, uh, what you get is a lot of cost saving, but 
in addition to that, you also get a lot of increase in your performance as well as security. Azure has an edge uh, in a way that it provides multiple tools to help you. Uh, we'll see what other features Azure has to offer that gives you an edge uh, with respect to other cloud providers. There are multiple categories of the services and primarily these services are uh, merged into four different uh, umbrellas. So you might have heard about these uh, before as well. Uh, I have tried to simplify uh, as much as I can regarding these services. On-prem is uh, where you manage everything. You can't exclude on-prem because that is where uh, most of the workload is today. And that is where from uh, you are migrating into cloud. When you talk about cloud, you talk about infrastructure as a service. When you say infrastructure as a service, think about virtual machines. Your virtualization, the server itself, that is uh, provider managed, uh, which is in the dark blue on the screen. Uh, in the light blue, that is all that you still need to manage. If you have virtual machines, in terms of AWS, if you have EC2 instances, you will still need to manage the OS. You will still need to manage the applications running on that OS, including the data on that OS. You will still need to perform patching. You will need to ensure that the OS inside the virtual machines, it is not missing any critical updates. When you talk about platform as a service, uh, think about a hosting uh, space like GoDaddy or Azure Web Apps. Uh, over here, you still uh, have to manage your applications. You still have to manage the code uh, with which your application is built and the data pertaining to that particular application. But where that application is deployed, which is the virtual machine behind the scene, the server where that application gets deployed, you don't need to worry about that. Now the OS goes out of the picture. You do not need to worry about the patching, the security updates, etc., for that particular OS. The final, the highest level of abstraction that a cloud can provide is software as a service. Over here, everything is uh, uh, managed by the provider. When you think about software as a service, think about an email provider like uh, Gmail. So you only use the service. You are not worried about uh, what is the code that provides you that service. Whether that code version is uh, having any security loopholes that you need to patch, uh, you do not need to manage any application code for, for example, Gmail. Uh, you just use your email. Uh, so that is how software as a service works. Uh, during the session, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat window. Uh, uh, I want this session to be as interactive as we can make it. So now let, let's address the question of why Azure. Azure is one of the true my, uh, hybrid cloud out there. With Microsoft Azure Stack, which is a solution which can manage your on-prem infrastructure, and Microsoft Azure, which is uh, the cloud, you can have services that are built uh, for one and they will work seamlessly for the other. For example, if your organization is not ready to move to cloud, uh, I would recommend that you start leveraging uh, Azure Stack to manage your on-prem infrastructure uh, privately and behind a firewall. Once you are ready, everything that you build for Azure Stack, that can translate to Microsoft Azure without uh, you doing anything uh, extra. All the ARM templates that will work for Azure Stack, they will also work for Microsoft Azure. You pay less versus AWS when you are leveraging Azure, especially for Microsoft services like SQL Server uh, and Windows Server. So if you are a Microsoft shop, uh, it makes complete sense to move to Microsoft Azure. So savings through existing licenses that you have. Uh, Microsoft has a offering which is called hybrid use benefit or hub licensing. Through that, you can realize up to 55% of the savings uh, when switching to cloud. So why not leverage those existing Microsoft investments? With Microsoft Azure, you can do more with open source. Uh, now that Microsoft have invested in GitHub, uh, Azure natively supports GitHub a lot. There is integration of GitHub 
uh, with multiple products like Azure Web Apps, you can have continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, with Azure Web Apps, uh, you can manage your whole Azure infrastructure as well as platform as services uh, directly from the CI CD pipelines. Azure has more regions than any other provider. It has around 54 regions, uh, which are the services of which are available in multiple regions or multiple countries. More than 95% of Fortune 500 companies, they use Azure companies like uh, Walmart, Lufthansa, uh, Log me in. Uh, there are multiple companies, especially the Fortune 500 companies. They leverage Azure uh, for their cloud consumption. So now we'll jump into what are the basic concepts uh, when you are beginning uh, to work in Azure. Uh, what are the basic concepts that will lay the right foundation? Once we go through this session, we'll see Azure in action uh, in a demo. So when you talk about Azure, you need to understand uh, what Azure environments are. There are primarily four environments. Azure provides uh, International Cloud, which is the most commonly used uh, Azure environment. Uh, it is named as Azure Cloud. Uh, then there is a separate environment uh, for German Cloud, uh, US Government Cloud, as well as Azure China Cloud. So these, the bottom three environments, they are segregated and are available for specific use in those uh, geographies. But Azure Cloud is the one that you will most commonly use. And this environment is accessible uh, via HTTPS, call and whack, whack, uh, portal.azure.com. This is what we will be using in the demos today. Next, uh, we talk about the regions. Uh, regions are where Microsoft physically go and deploy their data centers. A region could be East US, it could be West US, it could be Northern Europe, uh, and so on and so forth. Within each and every region, you need to understand two things. One, the concept of availability zones. Each region can have multiple availability zones. And what this means is within the same data center, they will have multiple sub data centers. So how are these different from each other? They will have a separate power source. And if Microsoft have to uh, perform any update management, uh, they need to apply any patches. That means they need to take down the servers for some time. Uh, then one availability zone will not affect any other availability zones in the same region. And this is where the uh, Microsoft SLA comes into picture as well. Uh, when you see uh, for some services that SLA is written 99.99%, that 0.01% that nobody thinks of, that is the time window, which roughly comes around to be uh, four to five hours in a year uh, time span. That is the time window when Microsoft performs their uh, updates on these servers. Uh, usually that is done during off hours, so you don't have anything to worry about, but Microsoft do communicate uh, well in advance that any such uh, update is going to occur. And because they have built a model in such a way, you can make your applications highly available by deploying them across uh, multiple availability zones. Now with regions, there is also a concept called paired region. Paired region is if you have services like uh, zone redundancy, then for example, East US, it will be paired with the North Central US. Then the services in the East US region that you deploy, uh, the services that will provide redundancy out of the box, they will replicate to its paired region. When you are setting up a disaster recovery strategy, you need to know this concept because then Selecting the paired region is most logical uh, since there is Microsoft Backbone that runs across the regions and this one will have uh, lowest uh, latency. When you're working with Azure, you can't work in Azure without uh, talking about role-based access control and the related uh, items. So before I talk about role-based access controls, let's talk about what is exactly in Azure. In Azure, everything that you will build, everything that you will work with uh, is termed as a resource. 
a resource is the smallest manageable unit within the whole Azure environment. A resource could be your virtual machine, it could be your uh, one web app, it could be a SQL database or any service. Anything that you deploy in Azure is termed as resource. Now, resource can only and only exist within a resource group. Think of resource group like a folder. It is logical grouping of resources. Unlike a folder, a resource can have only resources inside it. A resource group can't have another resource group inside it. Now, all these resource groups, they all exist within a subscription. Think of subscription as uh, how you get subscription to Netflix. Subscription is how you are able to leverage services of uh, Azure. Um, you have different models uh, based on the payment structure that you want to follow. If you want to pay something in advance, you have a different kind of subscription. Uh, you have a pay as you go subscription if you don't know what your consumption is going to look like. If you are an enterprise customer, you can have enterprise agreement subscription uh, wherein you commit to the total consumption. Uh, but at the same time, you get some discount uh, on your usage. If you have multiple subscriptions in your environment, then there is something called management group. Management group is nothing but a grouping of the subscriptions. It is there to manage your multiple subscriptions. Uh, if, for example, you want to provide access to somebody into multiple subscriptions all at once, uh, you can group them uh, via management groups and then provide access at the management group level. Now, once you know these concepts of resources and resource groups and subscription and management groups, you need to understand they all are hierarchical in nature. For example, the management group, it contains one or more subscriptions. A subscription will contain one or more resource groups and a resource group will contain one or more resources. Now, if you give access to somebody at any level, they will automatically get access at any of the uh, scope below that level. So some of the roles that you can grant to somebody is uh, an owner, a contributor, a reader. Let's say you are an owner at the subscription level. Uh, you have a subscription for development, uh, a separate subscription for testing. So you want to hire me as a developer and then you want to assign me access uh, only at a particular resource group level. So what you will do is you will grant me a contributor at that one resource group. You as an owner will be able to access everything within that subscription. If there are, let's say, four resource groups, you will be able to see all four resource groups. But since you assign me as a contributor only at one resource group, so I will be able to see resources only under that resource group. When I will log into the portal, I will not be able to see the other resource groups within that subscription. So this is how role-based access control works in, in its entirety. It is that simple. Uh, you just need to know the different scope levels and uh, you need to know the fact that it is hierarchical in nature. Now, the last concept that you need to understand as far as the basics uh, in Azure is concerned before we jump into the demo is understanding the ARM model. Uh, that is the Azure Resource Manager model. This is the latest model. This is the only model we are going to talk with, uh, talk about. Uh, earlier, there used to be ASM, Azure Service uh, Management model. Uh, that is outdated. Microsoft is no longer using it. It is there only for backward compatibility. Uh, any new resources must be using uh, ARM to leverage all the latest and greatest that Azure has to offer. So what exactly is ARM? ARM is the newer model for deploying and managing your application. In its entirety, it is nothing but just a set of APIs that Azure provides. It is the set of APIs on which the whole Azure works as well. So when you are building a VM in Azure, when you are building a database, when you are updating the database, behind the scene, everything is leveraging ARM APIs. These APIs uh, can be leveraged from various different tools. 
these APIs can be leveraged directly from the portal. When you work with Azure portal, these are the APIs which are behind the scene being invoked continuously. You can use a tool like Fiddler and actually see those APIs being invoked. You can use command line tools like Azure PowerShell or uh, Azure CLI, uh, which will work in any Linux distro as well. Uh, so you can work with ARM APIs through CLI directly from Linux. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the fact is that Microsoft has committed to use uh, Azure CLI as the primary citizen in Azure and PowerShell after the fact. So Azure CLI will get the latest and greatest features uh, uh, first, and any other tools, they will get the features later on. Even the features uh, come into the portal uh, after a particular period of time that they have come into Azure CLI. Visual Studio or any other uh, development IDEs that you use, you can use uh, ARM APIs directly through them. Uh, Visual Studio, uh, the professional or enterprise edition, uh, or the, even the community edition, Visual Studio Code as well, you can leverage the ARM APIs directly from there. So the resource manager, how the APIs work, these APIs in resource manager are provided by something called resource provider. So any type of resource that you can think of behind the scene, there is a resource provider for that. So that resource provider will provide you with the rest points, the APIs that you can invoke through the tools that we discussed. So for example, you work with the Azure Web App, App Service, there will be a separate resource provider for that. You work with uh, Azure VMs, there will be separate resource provider for that, and so on and so forth. So Microsoft has this documentation. You do not need to follow that documentation, but when you get into some advanced stuff, this is the basic that will help you understand uh, any advanced uh, configurations that anybody can throw your way in Azure. When you, uh, when you will start automating Azure, as we will see in the following sessions, uh, you will start using uh, ARM templates. ARM templates are nothing but uh, declaratively specifying what resources you want deployed and configured, uh, leveraging JSON format. I have authored a book around ARM templates, uh, the link to which uh, I'll be sharing after the session. Uh, we will also be covering the ARM templates in one of the following session. So now that we have talked about the primary concepts uh, pertaining to Azure, we go to our very first demo of this particular session. So this is how the Azure portal looks like. Right now I'm into portal.azure.com. Uh, on the top right, you can see uh, my personal email ID. This is my personal subscription uh, from my MVP. So you can see all your notifications right here. Uh, you can dismiss your notifications when you don't need. Uh, this is the home page that you are uh, provided with. On the left hand side, you have multiple favorites uh, that you can navigate. These are all the different types of resources we were just talking about. So for example, if you want to view the virtual machines, that is one of the first things that you do uh, when you start working with Azure. Uh, I recommend that you try and build a virtual machine, and that is what we are going to do in this session. You can create a free $200 credit uh, Azure account, um, and then you can play on your own with Azure as well. So for example, you see uh, I have multiple virtual machines here. Uh, I can click on any one of the virtual machine. When I navigate to that virtual machine, once it loads, you will see that this virtual machine exists in a particular resource group. Uh, that resource group is mentioned right here. Right now, the status is stopped and deallocated. It shows me the location. This is the region we were talking about. This is the region where this particular virtual machine is deployed. And then this virtual machine, which exists inside this RG-demo automation resource group, it exists within uh, the Virtual Studio Enterprise subscription the ID of which is also shown here. 
if I want to stop or start or restart the virtual machine, I can do that right from here. Uh, for now, I'll start this virtual machine. Uh, you can see the size of this virtual machine, how many vCPUs this has, how many uh, memory that this has, what is the operating system of this virtual machine. Um, on the left-hand side, there are multiple settings through which you can control the networking of this virtual machine. You can see uh, how many disks and what all disks are available for this virtual machine. If I click, it will take me to a different uh, view where I will be able to view the disks of this virtual machine. And as you can see, there is only one disk, which is of 127 uh, GB disk size. This is a standard SCD. The other choices that you have is uh, standard SSD or premium SSD. SSD is your typical magnetic based hard disk drive. Premium uh, SSD is your solid state drive. So if you start working with that, or, uh, if you have to build this virtual machine yourself, uh, how will you go about that? I'll cross out of this blade. So anything that opens up all these uh, screens, they are called blades in Azure. So if you have to build your own virtual machine, what you can do is once you navigate to virtual machine by clicking here, you can click on add and build that virtual machine. Or what you can do is you can click on create a resource. Here you will be presented with a catalog of all the services uh, that Microsoft offers. You can even search the marketplace uh, for not just the services that Microsoft provides, but the solutions that third party vendors have built leveraging Microsoft services. Uh, you can see that you even have quick start tutorials uh, for each of the services. You can navigate to different section and view more options for that. You can even search uh, the marketplace, as I said earlier. So for this particular demo, I'll build a Windows Server 2016 uh, data center virtual machine. Uh, all you need to do is just click on the name, and it will open up uh, a wizard. So here, uh, I will need to provide a resource group. As I said earlier, any and every resource, it exists only within a resource group. So it dynamically uh, does a check that whether this particular resource group already exists in Azure or not. Um, and then it tells me that you are good to go. I'll hit OK. You can provide a virtual machine name. Uh, it could be as simple as test VM uh, 201. And then you select the region. Uh, region is the data center that we were talking about earlier. Uh, for availability, you can select the availability uh, zones that we were talking about earlier. Uh, you can see that this particular region, East US, has multiple availability zones that we were uh, talking about earlier. This is where you select that. For this demo, I'll not uh, deploy it in a redundant fashion. You have multiple images based on which you can build this uh, particular VM. Since I selected Windows Server 2016 data center, that is the image that is already selected. You can uh, select one of the images provided by Microsoft, or uh, you can browse all images and disks, which will take you to another blade where you can select even the marketplace images. You can change the size here. Uh, for now, I'll leave it at default. Uh, it's at one CPU, 3.5 GB memory. It can go to really crazy amounts in Azure. And you can even change the size after building the VM on the fly. There will be a small uh, downtime. Uh, there will be a restart that will occur on the VM after the fact, but you have that capability. I'll provide it with uh, a username. This username can't be as simple as administrator. Uh, Microsoft has some checks uh, as well as for the password. It needs to be really, really uh, complex. Then your virtual machine can either be a private virtual machine that can that is accessible only on your private network uh, in your enterprise environment and not available online at all. If you want it to be publicly available, uh, for example, in my case, uh, you can select that and you can select the inbound port. 
RDP is the port that I highly discourage you to enable that. But if you need to connect to the VM, you do not have connectivity to your private network, then you have to enable RDP uh, for the inbound port to be able to connect to the virtual machine. Now, I was talking about the hybrid use benefit license earlier. Uh, so for Windows license, if you already own a license on-prem, uh, you can mark it as yes. Whatever the price is, uh, it will be reduced further. Uh, you have to confirm that you own the license and you have active software assurance uh, that your licensing team will know. You don't need to know about that. Uh, leveraging this, your cost of the virtual machine will be reduced significantly. This is what I was talking about, that if you already have Microsoft investments, you can leverage those investments er, and reduce the cost in the cloud by adopting Microsoft Azure as compared to its competitors. Now, as with any other uh, software wizard, I'll click next to go to the next screen. Here I can create more disks when the screen loads up. I can create and attach a new disk or I can attach an existing disk. I can select the OS disk type. Uh, for now, I'll select it as a standard STD, and then I can hit next to select the networking of this virtual machine. Now, this networking is your Azure virtual network. This networking is your private network within the cloud. You can connect this particular virtual network to your on-premises network uh, in a secure fashion. To connect, you can either use Express Route or you can use site-to-site -site VPN. You can even leverage point to site VPN if uh, you are the only one trying to connect to your virtual machine and access your VM in a very secure fashion. I leave the settings at defaults and I'll hit next. I leave the settings for management as uh, default as well. Uh, these are the settings where you enable monitoring on your uh, virtual machine. Um, you can assign a managed entity. You can enable auto shutdown that this virtual machine will be auto shut down at, uh, I'll change this to UTC. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, EST time zone. So around 7 p.m. EST, this virtual machine will automatically be shut down. Next day I lock in, uh, I can start that VM, uh, thereby uh, realizing potential cost savings. So why I say cost savings, the key concept here is you pay for only the time period you use this particular virtual machine. If you use this virtual machine only for eight hours, you don't pay for the 24 hours in the day. You, you pay only for the eight hours for which you leverage the virtual machine. This is the power of the cloud. So automatically you are realizing uh, cost savings. Uh, if the server was running on-prem, then you would have been uh, paying for the uh, cost of running the infrastructure to host that server, provide the virtualization, and manage that particular server. Now next, I can configure uh, the guest configurations. I can install extensions. For example, if you have uh, Chef or Puppet or Ansible to manage the configuration management of your environment. You can install an extension for the same. Uh, if you want a script to run on this particular VM, you can install an extension. Uh, if I click here, I can quickly show you. Uh, there are multiple extensions that are available. Custom script extension is what you want to use if you want a script to run after the virtual machine is deployed. And you can see there is this uh, extension for Puppet. There are multiple other extensions. For this demo, I'll keep it simple and I'll proceed to tags. The concept of tags is uh, same as uh, with any other cloud provider like uh, AWS. Uh, with tags, you can categorize your uh, resources. If you're working in an enterprise environment, you will have, for example, uh, hundreds of virtual machines. It becomes very difficult to manage those virtual machines. These virtual machines will exist in multiple resource groups. So, <coughs> excuse me. If you want to manage uh, and categorize these virtual machines, tags is the way to go. Tags are available for all the resources, not just virtual machines. They are available for, for SQL databases, for Azure Web App App Services. For each and every resource in Azure, you have the capability to categorize by leveraging tags. 
So for example, one of the tag that I always uh, apply is an application owner. This is uh, generally the name or email ID of a person uh, who should be contacted if there is something wrong with these resources. Who should be contacted if you want to later on right size up a virtual machine or any resource. Department is another good one uh, that you should apply to categorize your uh, resources. If you want to create a new tag, all you need to do is just start typing uh, that particular tag. So for example, uh, I type a demo tag and a demo value. Uh, that's it. Uh, I can simply apply that tag. It says here that this tag will be applied to seven resources. Uh, so when you are creating a virtual machine, you are not just creating a virtual machine. You are creating its NIC card. You are creating its public IP address. You are creating a storage account to log all the diagnostic information, virtual machine itself, and the virtual network that uh, we created. We could have used one of the existing virtual network. Excuse me. For simplicity, we are using uh, to create the. You are using the option to create a new virtual network. Uh, for the demo, I'll delete this tag. I'll hit next uh, to review and create. When I hit next to review and create, Microsoft Azure behind the scene, it runs uh, validations as you can see at the top of the screen. These validations, they go ahead and check whether the settings that you have selected, they are uh, compatible and a resource can be deployed. So for example, here uh, I have run into a validation error. I can click and see uh, what the error could be. So it says that uh, this resource was disallowed by uh, the policy. The policy is enforced tag and its value. So we can go ahead and see what that policy is. So for the demo, I'll not go into uh, this. I'll not go into uh, the policy itself, but uh, In fact, let's take a quick peek and uh, that uh, will show you how you can achieve compliance as well uh, when you are working with Azure. So all I'll need to do is either recreate the virtual machine, uh, uh, rerun that wizard, or I can uh, alter the policy or disable the policy for a quick while, or I can ensure that the virtual machine that I have selected, it follows that particular policy that I have set for myself. Aman, this is Wendy. Um, as you're doing that, just a couple of questions have come through. Um, and one of them is uh, the person says, we use, a, we use Linux as an environment. Does running Azure services on a Linux environment, is that supported by Microsoft? That is absolutely supported. Uh, I skimmed through this during the demo. But you have multiple distros uh, uh, which are supported out of the box. And then you also have uh, distros available from the marketplace that you can uh, use. Um, so, uh, it, and in fact, uh, now that Microsoft has investments into GitHub, uh, the open source integration is also there. Um, that means you can leverage uh, Linux environments and deploy them straight into Azure using the DevOps process uh, if you are uh, uh, having any. So along with that, as I said earlier, that Azure CLI is uh, the primary candidate in Azure. Um, so Azure CLI provides you with all the automation capabilities and you can run that directly from uh, Linux without moving into Windows environment. So you do not even need to have even a single Windows server uh, and you can still leverage Azure to its full uh, capability. Thank you. No problem. So what I did there is uh, I have gone into my subscription and uh, under the subscription, you can have policies. So these policy, policies, uh, they let you make your environment com uh, compliant. If somebody creates a resource and they misses the tag as I was doing, uh, then you can enforce that policy. The person will not be able to create the resource without a, uh, 
ensuring that that policy is taken care of and you are compliant in your environment. Now that I have removed that policy for this particular demo, uh, I can go ahead, I, you can see that the validation has passed. I can go ahead and create this particular resource. So once I do this, it triggers the creation of resources one by one. Uh, there's a relation between all the resources. For example, the resource group is deployed first because you can't have resources uh, without a resource group. So the resource group is deployed first and foremost. And as the automation has uh, started, uh, I can navigate to the Azure portal in another tab and navigate to resource groups by clicking on the option under favorites. And then uh, I can search for the resource group that I created by filtering the resource group name. So you can see this resource group, which has the name as demo basic session 01, which we created during the visit. Uh, it is already there. And you will see the resources have started coming in. In fact, almost all the resources uh, are created. The virtual machine is, will still be in creating. If I click on the virtual machine again, it will open up another blade, and this should say uh, creating or starting uh, in the status once it loads up. So as you can see, this is where you see the status of this particular virtual machine. It is right now in the creating state. I can close out of this blade. Uh, what all resources were created? Uh, storage account, virtual network, virtual machine, disk, network interface, public IP and network security group were some of the resources that were created. If you want to connect to your virtual machine, all you need to do is uh, navigate to your virtual machine that you want to connect to. So for the demo, I'll click on this uh, demo VM 101, which we started in the beginning of this particular demo, and then you see this already has a public IP address uh, linked to it. So I can hit connect. Uh, it will give me an RDP file, uh, or you can simply RDP to this particular uh, IP address. And then it, will it may give you a warning like this, uh, hit connect. Uh, it will ask you for your credentials. I will provide my credentials. Uh, since the credential that I have uh, uh, is a local user, not a domain user, I am using dot slash to uh, indicate that. And then after that, uh, the VM you will be able to connect to the VM. So right now I'll uh, go back to the presentation part of the session. I wanted this session to be more interactive and that's why we spent a lot of time on the demo so that uh, after the session, you can get your hands dirty and start playing with Azure. But uh, we'll move on with the next section, which is working with Azure. What are the different general services? Uh, I have tried to list down the services, uh, the minimal number of services that you need to know or uh, read about. Uh, you can learn about these services after this particular session. These are the services with which you will be spending your 90% of the time. These are the service which you will be working with directly or indirectly with different teams. So knowing these services help you a lot. Azure Virtual Machines, as we saw, this is the primary infrastructure as a service from Microsoft. Azure Virtual Networks provides the backbone, uh, a network inside, virtual, uh, inside Azure environment through which you can connect to your virtual machines, you can link them to your on-prem network as well. Azure Storage provides you a space where you can store files like images or uh, VHD files or any other blobs, any file for that matter. It, uh, it extends beyond a file storage. It uh, has the file share capabilities to it and tables and queues cap capability to it as well. You have Azure Monitor which includes sub-services like uh, log analytics, network watcher, et cetera. This is there to monitor your whole infrastructure. So when you will have virtual machines, you will need to monitor those virtual machines as well. Apart from the default monitoring capabilities that is provided out of the box from uh, Azure, 
uh, this goes beyond that. This can look inside the virtual machine, inside your platform as a service, and can provide you a single pane of glass to monitor everything. Azure Security Center, as the name suggests, it is there to check the vulnerabilities in your whole Azure infrastructure and provide you with recommendations. You can monitor the security of the whole environment and ensure that you are compliant and secure and that there are no vulnerabilities using Azure Security Center. If you are a uh, developer or come from developer background, these are the services that will be of interest to you. Uh, Azure Web App, uh, it is clubbed under App Service uh, umbrella. So in the portal, you will see App Service as the option. Azure Web App is one of the App Service. Other options are uh, mobile app or function app. Uh, this is Microsoft's uh, PaaS service for hosting uh, enterprise web applications. You have SQL databases, AKS, and Azure DevOps as well. Uh, these are self-explanatory services. Uh, you can have a separate session for each of uh, these services. They are that vast. Uh, I blog about these services from time to time. So you can check out my blog as well uh, at harvestingclouds.com and even at uh, Greenhouse Data's uh, blog on the Greenhouse Data website. So finally, I have a couple of tips and tricks. Uh, if you have been playing with Azure, uh, these tips and tricks will help you navigate Azure better and make you more efficient. Uh, these are quick tips and tricks that will help you. I'll quickly run through them and then I'll show you the tips and tricks in action in the last demo of this session. So if you want to navigate to multiple resources, uh, the search box at the top, that is your friend. Uh, you do not want to click on all services all the time and clicking on uh, favorites. You can't have each and every services favorited uh, on the left-hand side. So this search box at the top, this is uh, your uh, quick friend. It can not only help you navigate to different services and resources, it can even help you find the documentation without leaving uh, Azure portal. If you want to find solution to most common problems, uh, you will have diagnose and solve problems option for each and every resource in Azure. It will give you a link to multiple documentations and most common uh, scenarios that you may incur uh, prior to opening Microsoft support case. This is the place that you should check if you're facing any issues with any of the resources in Azure. Next, if you want to bootstrap your automation, uh, when we were creating the virtual machine, there was this uh, tiny little link at the bottom, which is to download a template for automation. All that we did to create the virtual machine, you do not need to repeat that. If you want to create, let's say, 20 VMs, you can download this template and execute that template 20 times in multiple environments. So this template is actually an ARM template that gives you the automation capabilities. Another method to get that template for resources that you are already there. Somebody has created the resources. You want to generate a template for them, uh, for those resources, because you want to recreate the resources in a different environment, for example. So every resource, every resource group will have this option for automation script. Once you click on this, you can click on the download and get the template for all the resources in that resource group. You can later on, once you have the template, the JSON file, you can play with that and update the resources that you want, that you want to redeploy in multiple environments. I have kept some of the references uh, that can help you kickstart your journey. Uh, you can get lost when you are working with Azure. Uh, there is so much documentation, so many different pieces of information. The first link is what I recommend that you should start at. This is the link which you should use uh, to uh, start your journey. So the tips and tricks that I was showing, let me quickly give you a quick demo. Uh, so this search box at the top is what I was uh, talking about earlier. Uh, let's say I have a key vault that I want to navigate to. Key vault is a secure, way, a secure vault where you can store your uh, credentials or your certificates. So as soon as I type key in the search box, you can see that I have a product key vault that I can directly navigate to. This is a resource. Or I can see all the key vaults by clicking here and navigating to the key vault services. 
I can even search for Key Vault solutions in Marketplace or search the documentation right from here. We'll navigate back to the virtual machine that we were creating, uh, that we had created earlier. So if you look under the settings, uh, the last setting is for automation script. That will get you the template that we were talking about earlier. So you can directly click uh, download here. It will not only click give you the uh, template, but also the parameters file as well as uh, the script to deploy that template. What it entails, we'll be covering that in a later session. But uh, this brings to uh, us to the end of the session. If there are any other questions, uh, I can take those up now. Great, thank you. Um, there are some other questions. Um, the next question that we had come through is, is there a cost breakdown within the portal and a running monthly cost? Uh, there is one I can quickly show you. You can uh, you have cost management and billing section. Um, you can view your cost at the subscription level or you can uh, manage your cost here. Uh, and uh, drill uh, deep into this, uh, you have something called Cloudine that is uh, a third party solution which Microsoft acquired and is now uh, baked into the Azure portal. Uh, it provides you with multiple analysis. This is where you perform all the analysis, uh, the accumulated costs for Feb uh, 2019, the granularity is accumulation. Uh, so you can see this month or last month, this quarter, uh, you can even have a custom wherein you can specify your uh, date range. And uh, for example, I want to see the cost for from January till the end of February. I can do that and hit okay. Uh, my account is uh, still in the India region, so I see all the cost in uh, rupees instead of dollars. Uh, but this is where uh, you can view the cost analysis. Great. Um, and then we have time for one final question, which is, are dev services added on top of virtual machines, or are they deployed individually? They are deployed individually. So for example, let me show you SQL database real quick. Uh, these services, you don't even get access uh, to the underlying infrastructure. Microsoft controls that infrastructure for your own good. So for example, if I want a database, uh, it's right here. I can simply uh, say add and create a new database and simply start connecting to that database and adding data to that database. Uh, the underlying virtual machine is nowhere to be seen. You have the server, uh, but the underlying VM itself, uh, uh, that is abstracted. You can control the settings uh, from Azure portal, but that's about it. Uh, whatever settings you want to control as a SQL admin, uh, you will have the option, but as a configuration element in the Azure portal. So it's completely platform as a service. Uh, the Virtualization layer, the VM layer, that is abstracted for you. Great. Um, I want to thank everyone again for joining. Here is Amon's contact information. And I also put information in the chat window if you want to take a look right before we log off. Again, we appreciate your time. I know that everyone is really busy. And we will be continue to do a series of these webinars, which you'll get an email notification about. And everyone who has attended today will get a copy of the presentation. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone.